Welcome to Xbox 360. Bienvenido a Xbox 360. Welcome to Xbox 360. Ever since Phil Spencer announced backwards compatibility support for the Xbox 360, there has been a conversation on what the feature brings to the table and how important it is. This conversation only grew louder when Microsoft later announced that some Xbox 360 titles will be enhanced on the Xbox One X with higher resolutions and better performance. Over the years, new games have been added to the backwards compatibility catalog pretty much on a weekly basis, and now the program supports over 600 titles after their last update almost one year ago. While the Wizards at Xbox have shifted focus on making sure the entire Xbox One catalog will work on the Xbox Series X, I thought we'd take a quick look at some Xbox 360 games running on the Xbox One X and compare how they look and run on original hardware. Unfortunately, I don't have a standard Xbox One to add to the mix, but at least with the One X, we can view the emulator in the best possible light. So get comfortable as we check on the current state of the Xbox Backwards Compatibility Program. Okay, so what better game to start with than the first 360 game seen running on the Xbox One? That's right, we're going to take a look at Mass Effect. Originally published by Microsoft in 2007, Bioware created a space RPG where the player had the option to explore the universe in an epic adventure. The project was ambitious, maybe a bit too ambitious for Unreal Engine 3. See, at this time, the engine wasn't well suited for streaming large worlds or open areas. Most games using UE3 stuck to the more linear design seen in games like Gears of War. This resulted in Mass Effect suffering in a few areas, namely texture pop-in, loading, and performance. So are these issues cleaned up on the Xbox One X? Yes, but not entirely. First off, the game runs at 1280 by 720 with 2 times MSAA on both the 360 and the One X. Image quality isn't great by today's standards, especially when played on a 4K display, but you get used to it. As we load into the game, the first improvement we see are shorter load times on the Xbox One X. The additional memory in the system can be used as a cache for older games, allowing data and assets to be loaded into memory faster than on the aging 360. Texture pop-in is also greatly improved on the X. This is a good time to mention that every game shown today is running off of the hard drive on the 360 to give the best performance possible. While we're talking about textures, filtering is bumped up to 16 times anisotropic filtering when played on the Xbox One X. While these improvements are appreciated, I'm sure performance is what many care most about. Starting with the jog around the Citadel, we can already see the 360 struggle while the frame rate is pretty solid on the One X. You'll notice that the biggest drops on the 360 occur during a camera turn, when the system needs to load a new scene of assets. All of that geometry is likely hammering the CPU withdrawal calls, and developers were still trying to master multi-core programming at that time. The virtual cores on the Xbox One emulator do a much better job, though we still can see some slight drops here and there. Cutscenes show a similar story. The 360 will drop down to 20 frames per second as the double buffered V-Sync fails to disable at first, just for it to turn off and we're introduced to a handful of torn frames. Meanwhile, the Xbox One hums along at a solid 30 frames per second with no tearing thanks to the mandatory V-Sync forced by the emulator. We see similar behavior with this cutscene introducing Ashley, drops down to the low 20s and torn frames. This also leads us into the biggest trouble spot with Mass Effect's frame rate, combat. The combination of effects and AI just bring the 360 to its knees. You can see the 360 drop down to the single digits during this late game encounter. To be fair, the frame rate also suffers on the One X, but not quite as bad as we see on last gen hardware. 
It'll be interesting to see if the Series X can finally lock this game to a solid 30 frames per second through brute force alone. The gameplay is unpolished in ways, and as we've covered, Mass Effect can suffer from technical issues, but I still think it's an excellent RPG that's still worth a look today. Now let's move on to another Unreal Engine 3 game, Gears of War Judgment. While Mass Effect was one of the early UE3 titles, Judgment came late in the generation and at this point the engine has come a long way. Features such as soft body physics, tessellation, improved texture streaming, large crowd rendering, better optimization for open areas, a light mass global illumination technique, and more have all been added to the engine throughout the years. Needless to say, Unreal Engine 3 was much more mature and capable at this point in the generation. I'd go so far to say that Gears of War Judgment is one of the best looking games on the Xbox 360, despite the change in game design turning off some Gears fans. Starting with the comparison, both the 360 and One X run at the same 1280 by 720 resolution, with FXAA applied to smooth over the jaggies. Again the image quality suffers, but at least it's smoother than Mass Effect thanks to the anti-aliasing used here. Surprisingly, loading and texture filtering are about the same on both platforms. Texture popping is also non-existent thanks to the improved engine. So with no improvements to image quality, filtering, or loading, you might be wondering why I picked this game. Well, in the early days of the backwards compatibility program, Gears War Judgment did not run great at all. This was especially true for the firefights featuring waves of enemies rushing towards the player. However, throughout the years, Microsoft has worked to improve the emulator, increasing performance and stability. So how does the game run today? Really well, actually. In this museum battle, we can see the 360 buckle under pressure when the action gets heated while the One X is a flat line throughout. This next action-packed scene with the silverback mech shows another example of a rock-solid frame rate on the One X and drops on the 360. The game doesn't run bad on either system, but the performance is now a lot better on the Xbox One X. Gears Judgment may be divisive among the community, but it's not a bad game and can still provide loads of fun, especially in co-op.
Next, we're going to look at a game that has seen a lot of improvements since the program launched in 2015, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. The game really wasn't what Banjo fans were expecting when it first launched on the Xbox 360, but it was still a gorgeous and impressive looking title. Featuring large open worlds and a vibrant art style, I've always appreciated the graphics even if the gameplay never really grabbed me. The first major difference we see is a massive jump in resolution when played on the Xbox One X. Using what Microsoft calls the Haichi method, named after the engineer who invented the feature, Eric Haichi, the game sees a 9 times increase in resolution. So in the case of Banjo-Kazooie, we see the game running at 1280 x 720 with 2 times MSAA on the 360, but when we move over to the Xbox One X, we get a boost to 3840 x 2160 or full 4K resolution while still using 2 times MSAA. The increase in detail is truly amazing when you consider no work needs to be done by the developers and everything is handled by the emulator. Thanks to the higher resolution, shadows and textures come through clearer than ever. The game is truly gorgeous to look at on a 4K display and demonstrates how even then, Rare was a tech powerhouse. Again, we also see a bump in texture filtering on top of the increase in fidelity. Okay, so better resolution, cleaner effects and textures, but how does the game run? Like Gears of War Judgment, Banjo-Kazooie also ran worse on the Xbox One in the early days. Thankfully, things have changed and now the game runs great on both platforms. Even when we see some slight drops on the 360, the Xbox One version is nice and smooth. Load times is another area where we see a nice boost on the One X. It's not terrible on the 360, but it's a lot shorter on the 4K console. Banjo-Kazooie is another clear sign that the emulator has come a long way, and Microsoft's engineers deserve a lot of credit here. Not only is the game great to look at today, but it plays better than ever. So if you're a fan of the game, or have been curious about Rare's third take on the series, there's no better way to play than on the Xbox One X. Now it's time to look at another 360 classic and one of my favorite launch games, Call of Duty 2. Featuring more advanced shaders, larger battles, and more complex AI, Call of Duty 2 was definitely a step up over the first entry in the series. Anyone who's played the demo prior to the 360's launch will recognize this level from the British campaign. At the time, it was really impressive to see this game running on a $400 box. So how does it hold up today on the Xbox One X? Well, first off, no improvements to image quality here. The game runs at 1280 x 720 on both the 360 and the One X. Load times are shorter, but only by a couple of seconds on average. Nothing major. <music> on the 
Unfortunately, it also looks like the forest texture filtering in the emulator is not enabled when playing this game. Thankfully, we do see a massive boost in the area that matters most, frame rate. Call of Duty has a long history of targeting 60 frames per second, and that holds true for the 2005 release as well. However, the game had a hard time hitting that target frame rate on the Xbox 360, and usually ran well below that number in action-heavy scenes. We can see how the smoke and hordes of enemies flooding the player is too much for the 360 to handle, while the One X doesn't miss a beat. Again we see a combination of alpha effects and NPCs will drop the frame rate down to 30 frames per second on last gen hardware while the One X is rock solid. As I was capturing footage for this game, I was reminded how much fun it is, and why I still think it's the best World War II Call of Duty title to date. Unless Activision ever provides us with a remaster of this classic, this is the best way to play on consoles today. We've looked at a game set in the past, now let's look at a game taking place in the future, Zone of Enders 2 The Second Runner. Included in the Zone of Enders HD collection, the second game was plagued with graphical flaws and a dodgy frame rate. Unlike the PS3 version, Konami never patched and fixed the 360 version, so owners were left with a less than stellar port in the end. Let's see if Microsoft's emulator can step in and help brute force this port into a decent version. Starting with resolution, we see the same 1280 by 720 number in both versions. A bit disappointing, but at least the text filtering does see an increase when played on the Xbox One X. Loading is hardly an issue on either console. Surprisingly though, the One X is slightly slower than the 360 when loading in a new game. Just like some of the other games we've looked at, the biggest improvement comes with performance. The frame rate never hits 60 frames per second during combat when played on the 360. The massive amount of particle effects and enemies really tax the older hardware. Thankfully, this is much improved on the Xbox One X, where the game feels a lot better to play and does a better job at sticking to the target frame rate. That's not to say that everything is perfect. This massive battle featuring countless enemies and allies fighting over a large field really pushes both systems. Here we see the 360 dropping down to the teens, and while the One X version isn't holding a solid 60 frames either, it's still a huge improvement over that choppy mess. In my experience, this isn't common, and when played on the One X, it performs great in most instances. We never got a port for Zone of Enders 2 on the Xbox One, but with backwards compatibility support, we at least have a decent way to play the game today. With all the rumors circulating around the revival of the Fable franchise, I figured it would be cool to take a look at the last main entry in the series, Fable 3. I chose this game because it was more demanding than Fable 2. With improvements to textures, resolution, and effects, it's clear the team put in the effort to improve the engine. So how does Albion look today? Well, let's find out. Right off the bat, we can see there is a huge boost in image quality. 
The game runs at 1280 by 720 on the 360, with what looks to be some sort of temporal blur to try to smooth over the jaggies. This translates into a full native 4K image with the same blur on the One X. Along with the increase in resolution, we see a nice bump to texture filtering as well. In my opinion, the higher resolution, better filtering does wonders for the texture work in the game. The world just pops a lot more, and the blur seems less intrusive than on Microsoft's last gen console. Load times are also reduced on the Xbox One X. Here we can see loading in a new game is twice as fast on the One X as it is on the 360. There are similar improvements when loading into a new area. Despite the game running at 4K, performance also holds up surprisingly well. Whether we're running through a forest or taking a stroll around town, both versions stick closely to the 30 frame per second target. Even during combat, both systems turn in solid results. While Fable 3 may not be the most popular entry in the franchise, it's still a good game and worth a playthrough as we wait to see what Microsoft has in store for the series. Moving on, Sonic Generations is the next game on the list and one of my favorite 3D Sonic games. This 2011 release sees Sonic running through fan favorite levels reimagined for this new adventure. Running on the Hedgehog engine, the game features an impressive global illumination technique, great texture work, and gorgeous post-processing effects. So let's see how the game stacks up today. Running at around 896 by 720 with what looks to be FXAA, the resolution is on the low side, even by last gen standards. To be fair, image quality isn't that much of an issue when the game is in motion, mostly thanks to the excellent motion blur. Loading the game up on the Xbox One X, we see the resolution jump up to 2688 by 2160. Of all the games so far, Sonic Generations may benefit the most from Microsoft's 4K console. The colorful art direction, detailed character models, and beautiful levels just jump off the screen at higher resolutions. In fact, Sonic Generations runs at a higher resolution on the One X than the current gen Sonic Forces. What used to be a good looking game is now just flat out gorgeous through emulation.
Texture filtering is yet again improved, but to be honest that was never really an issue with high speed and momentum being the focus. Load times were already quick on the 360 and are even quicker now on the One X. When it comes to performance, the game runs pretty well on both platforms. However, when things get hectic, both versions can drop, and this is when the 360 can really struggle to keep up. We also see these transparency effects from Metal Sonic's attacks causing consistent drops on the 360. This points to the game hitting memory bandwidth limitations. On the flip side, this battle runs just fine on the Xbox One X, despite pushing so many more pixels. Whether you're playing Sonic Generations for the first time, or giving the game a repeated run, the best way to play on console is definitely on the Xbox One X. Up next, we look at another Unreal Engine 3 game, Lost Odyssey. Microsoft partnered with Mistwalker and Field Plus to produce one of the best JRPGs on the 360. Anyone who's played the game will remember this badass beginning cutscene and how impressive the transition to real-time gameplay was. Much like Mass Effect, Lost Odyssey was another one of the earlier Unreal Engine 3 titles. Also like Mass Effect, the game design was not well tailored for the engine at that time. As we covered earlier in this video, Texture pop-in was a problem early on, and this game required new assets to be loaded any time you hit a random battle. So to get around the pop-in issue, load times were quite lengthy, and only got worse as your party grew and you faced larger groups of enemies. These load times were improved when Microsoft added the option to install games on the 360's hard drive, and are cut down even further now on the Xbox One X. While we're talking about load times, we see a few seconds shaved off when loading in a game save. Another sign of some teething issues with the engine is the performance. As a whole, the game doesn't run bad, but we do see the frame rate take a hit from time to time, especially during combat or real-time cutscenes with these split-screen camera angles. Pretty much all these issues are corrected through backwards compatibility on the Xbox One X. The game runs great with a solid frame rate to go along with the faster load times.
I did run into one weird issue on the Xbox One, where the real-time shadows in this scene would freak out every time it was played. This bug doesn't show up on the 360, at least in all the hours I played to record for this video. Also, as you've probably noticed by now, the game does not run at a higher resolution on the One X. We still see the same 1280 by 720 pixel count with 2 times MSAA on both platforms. That's not to say the game doesn't still look great in ways. Character models are highly detailed with great design showing physics on clothing and hair that animates. Something we typically didn't see in Unreal Engine 3 titles at the time. Texture filtering appears to be the same in both versions, but that was never really an issue in this game. Lost Odyssey is the perfect game to scratch that classic JRPG itch and oddly enough is more of a Final Fantasy game than any official Final Fantasy game last gen. This makes sense when Mist Walker was founded by one of the fathers of the Final Fantasy series, Hironobu Sakaguchi. So check it out if you enjoy mature themes and turn-based battles. Speaking of Final Fantasy, our final game in this video is Final Fantasy XIII, and it's here where we see some of the biggest improvements yet in the backers compatibility program. Running on the Crystal Tools engine, it's clear that the devs at Square Enix had issues adopting the engine to the 360 and try to compensate with a sub-HD resolution and compressed full motion videos. Due to these cutbacks, the game does not hold up well today, especially when played on a high resolution screen. Running at 1024 by 576, the game's art and assets are hurt by dithering, shimmering, and jaggies. 2x MSAA is applied to the game, but it does little to help clean up these issues. Meanwhile, the FMVs turn into a soup of artifacts thanks to the Bing format and low bitrate. It's in these key areas that we see a huge improvement on the Xbox One X. On the enhanced console, we get a 3072 by 1728 resolution again with 2 times MSAA in effect. While not hitting a native 4K resolution, the image quality is still extremely clean, and only now are we able to better appreciate the excellent assets used in the game. The texture work and material shaders show a lot of depth and detail at these higher resolutions. Hair rendering benefits greatly from the increase in pixel counts. The dithered or screen door-like artifacts are greatly reduced, and the game as a whole is just so much more temporarily stable. This goes for other alpha textures as well, such as the plants in this scene. This brown twiggy bush reminds me more of a net on the 360 version, instead of an actual plant like we see on the One X. How about those pre-rendered FMVs I mentioned before? How do they scale on current gen systems? Well it's here where Microsoft went above and beyond with their backwards compatibility efforts. They actually injected or replaced the low quality bitrate video files with much higher quality versions. It really is crazy how much of a night and day difference we have here in Clarity. To round out the boost in image quality, we see better filtering to go along with the increase in pixel count. By now you might be wondering how the game runs on both platforms. Well to be fair, the game already ran pretty good on the Xbox 360. This beginning sequence is a pretty good example, and here we see both versions holding a solid frame rate. We might see some single frame drops on the 360 that are mostly cleared up on the One X, but performance really isn't a problem here. The same can be said while running through a level full of enemies. We get solid results for the vast majority of playtime here. What's interesting is that we do see a slight dip on both platforms as lightning jumps over this pile of rubble. We see similar behavior later on in the game, where we see great performance on both platforms, just for it to slightly dip. 
I think the game is hitting the hard drive during these moments, streaming in new data in the memory. So this seems to be more of an IO bottleneck than something directly related to the CPU or GPU. Last but not least, we do get shorter load times on the Xbox One X. It's hard to emphasize how impressive the improvements are to Final Fantasy XIII. To be honest, I was never really a fan how it looked on the 360. The dithering alone was far too much for me. So it's a bit odd that the best console version of this game is now on an Xbox platform. In this video, we looked at a range of games, all enhanced in various ways. The titles updated for the Xbox One X can pass for remasters in many respects. Even with no One X specific patch, we still see better frame rates, filtering, load times, and other improvements through the emulator. This generation, I think Microsoft proved that backwards compatibility is more than just supporting your library or preserving games from the past. It also provides the opportunity to relive old favorites or experience new adventures for the first time. So I'm excited to see how the feature evolves when Microsoft continues the backwards compatibility journey later this year with the launch of Xbox Series X. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching the video. If you enjoy this kind of content, go ahead and subscribe, hit the like button, and let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope everyone's staying safe, staying healthy, wearing your masks, and staying indoors. Until the next video, I'll see you guys later.